Well, we've uh, introduced ourselves enough. We don't have to do it anymore. We just want to tell you how much we appreciate being here. The warmth, the wonderful except, uh, reception that we have had here is just incredible. Your church is very reflective of the way uh, you folks are. When we drove up here, we saw the way the, the church is, and it reflects the love that is in here, and we appreciate it so much. We've enjoyed being with you and uh, the wonderful potluck. We're going to come back next week. And uh, <laughs> it, it was just, yeah. <laughs> It is absolutely a wonderful time. You've made this a, a very, very enjoyable time. And uh, we pray that you will take these notes and that you will use these for your own study. We invite you to go to the website, knowinggodministries.com, and you will find over 200 uh, tapes there that you can download for nothing. We don't charge for any of this. You can use them for witnessing for your own. You can uh, use them for when you're driving back and forth and whatever you you would like to do. Be sure and pick up your notebook before you go. You know, we're we're not out trying to advertise. We try to give articles in the record, let people know what we're doing, try to let people know. We sent out DVDs to pastors to let them know what we're doing, but we we do not go out and try to drum up business, but if you find that there are churches that you feel would be able to benefit from something like this, let them know, and we'll try to go through the the uh, plan of getting it ready. Uh, we try to go where we feel that God is calling us to go, and we don't have any great big uh, ad campaign at all, and we're trying to let the Father guide us in this, and we are so grateful that he guided us to this church. You're wonderful. It's wonderful to know that we have this kind of a brotherhood uh, in our church. Ernie, 30 minutes. Well, I'm going to take a vote. <laughs> I'm going to take a vote. Let's see. Eyesight's not as good. It's 105. So I'm going to let you vote. 110. Is it 110? Okay, 110. Thank you. Would you go sit down? <laughs> I'll give Rob one little job to do, and he just can't even do that. He wants to walk around. All right. First of all, I have a masterpiece of a sermon. That's just, it'd be the most fantastic thing you've ever heard. But it's three hours long. Or we can be out of here at 140. So let's take a vote. How many want the three-hour one? I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it up to these two nice girls here. <laughs> Would, wouldn't you all prefer the thirty-minute one? Wouldn't you prefer the thirty-minute one? <laughs> oh, they probably have some hot dates tonight, so you know we'll probably just because they're nice, we'll go with the thirty-minute one. So appreciate that. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If God carried a billfold, your photo would be in it. Every morning, God gives you a beautiful sunrise. Every evening, He gives you a beautiful sunset. And every spring, He gives you beautiful flowers. And every time you talk, he listens. God could live anywhere in the entire universe, but he's chosen to live in your heart. Don't you get the picture? God is crazy about you. And that is the theme of our Knowing God's Ministries. Today we're going to look at the name of Elohim. In the Bible, it's capital G, little o, little d. It is the most popular name of God, just by the times that it's in there. You'll find Elohim in the Old Testament 2,200 
and 50 times. It is the most mentioned name, and Yahweh is the second one. It's also the first name that God <coughs> excuse me, used to introduce himself, and we find it the fourth word. In the beginning, God. And that's Elohim. What does Elohim mean? Well, first of all, Elohim is making a statement as well as a promise. The promise is, and the statement, is I have created you and I will sustain you and I will make a covenant that I will never, never leave you. I've created you, I've given you the power to sustain you, and I'll take an oath, I'll make a promise, I'll make a covenant that I will never abandon you. And that's the word we're going to look at this afternoon. Now here a while back, there was a lady, I think in California, that had eight babies, remember that? The octoblet, well, big words. You know, I'm, I missed English one day, and I'm sure that was the word they went over, was that word, or octoblets, or whatever it is. See, that's what happens when you go to college, girls, for nine years, and you miss a class. <laughs> Get the wrong word. She had eight kids. Now, can you imagine one mom, eight kids, all fighting for their attention? Do you know sometimes, if we're not careful, we look at God like that. One God, billions of people, and does He have time for me? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. For you see, Elohim is not made to a church, is not made to a nation, is not made to a congregation, that promise is made to one person, and that person is you. And so he says to you individually, I've created, I've given you the power, I've sustained your life, but I take an oath, I will never forget you, or I'll never abandon you. What a wonderful name, what a wonderful, wonderful name promise. Now, going to school and having Rob as one of my teachers, he gave me a C- in Greek. I just don't know how he could have such a semi-brilliant student like me and not appreciate me. <clears throat> but you know, in Arlington, we're just simple people in Arlington. And so I want you to take a second and let's look at this word covenant. Now you know in theology covenants knocked around all the time. Some people say, well, there's an old covenant and there's a new covenant, but the old covenant comes after the new covenant because the new covenant was before the old covenant and now I'm confused. So I want to share with you what I think is the correct covenant. Now these texts are in your uh, guide, so don't bother looking them up, because after all, these two girls say we have only 30 minutes and then we're out of here, so i got to move a little faster. So when we go to Exodus, the sixth chapter, I want to share with you a definition of a covenant. And there's going to be a test, so I want you to pay attention. In the sixth chapter of Exodus, God says to his children, it's very simple. My covenant is I want to be your God and you be my people. And then we go to Exodus, the 29th chapter, and again God is talking to his children of Israel and he says, I want you to be my people and I want to be your God. Then I go over to, uh, well, let's go over to Jeremiah. And if we want to look at the 21st chapter, God says, I want to be your God 
and you be my people. And then we look at Jeremiah 31. I want to be your God and you be my people. We look at 32nd chapter of Jeremiah. I want to be your and you be my people. And we could go to Zechariah. We can go to Daniel. We can continue to do this for quite a while. Covenant. Oath. It's simple. The covenant that God wants with us is what He's always wanted. Simply, I would like to be your God and you be my people. We call that in modern theology a relationship. And that's what God desires from you. He desires a relationship where you can talk, share, visit, and get to know each other. So God comes along and the very first name He chooses is Elohim. I will make that covenant that I'll be your God. I want you to be my people and I will give you the power to sustain you and I will not abandon you. I always like illustrations. I think illustrations do a lot better than words. So I want to look at two people in the Old Testament that understood the power of the name of Elohim. And the first one is Joseph. In the 50th chapter of Genesis, we find Joseph and he's about to die. He knows he's on his deathbed and he calls his sons together. And he tells them that things will not always be good for the children of Israel in Egypt and that someday God is going to lead them out to the promised land. And it's very interesting because the name that Joseph uses to his sons, he says, I know that my Elohim the one that has a covenant that will not abandon us, I know that one day my Elohim will lead us out into the promised land. And when Elohim does that, will you take my bones and carry them with you into the promised land? And I can remember as a young boy, my daddy uh, kind of shocked me Back then, people didn't go to movies at all, and my daddy just didn't believe in movies. But he wanted my brother and I to go see the Ten Commandments when it came out. And uh, so after getting over the shock, I said, well, sure. But I remember in the Ten Commandments, one of the things struck me, and I must have been 12 or 13 at the time, was the fact that when the children of Israel left Egypt, I remember for some reason that they were carrying the bones of Joseph with them as they left that over into the promised land. Let's look at the life of Joseph. How in the world did he come to trust God? Well, let's look at his life. Young boy, a little cocky. You girls are never cocky now, are you? No, okay, I knew you wasn't. You're all too sweet. Little cocky. You know, he has a new coat, many colors, and of course he kind of prances around to his brothers, and we know the story. So the next thing we find, Joseph thrown in a pit left to die. Well, here come some Egyptians. Traveling band, and Joseph gets out of that situation. He's taken to Egypt, finds a good job, and all of a sudden, what happened to him? Someone lied. Accused him of something horrible. And where do we find Joseph? Right back in prison. Well, he makes some friends. And God leads him to help these friends. One of them he helped real well, and the other one didn't have such good news, did he? And so Joseph, we can imagine him saying, Well, I know this is going to work out. So the guy gets out of prison, promises to do what? To remember Joseph, and what does he do? Just like all people do, when you're in a tight, they'll promise you anything. Then when they get out of it, they forget. And so here's Joseph still sitting in prison. Did God forget him? 
Did God abandon him? No. And so one day there's a big time problem in Egypt. And then all of a sudden the guy says, hey. And then here comes Joseph out. No wonder, because in his spiritual journey, there was the highs and there was the lows. There was the highs and there were the lows. But Joseph had faith through his relationship, through his experience, that no matter what, he knew of Elohim who would not abandon him. And so as he lay dying, he called upon the same friend that you have and that I have and says, count on him because he will come through, take my bones because I want to be in that promised land with you. Let me share with you an insight into Elohim because there is a God who loves and who trusts, but it doesn't mean that He always will give us a great ending. And so I think of the martyrs. I think of the martyrs who trusted Elohim, who prayed to Elohim, I think of the martyrs that in the Roman Empire who they took for many miles and miles and miles and they put them on crosses on each side of the road leading to Rome. And if that wasn't bad enough, they set fire to them. They believed in Elohim. But I have a question. Was their ending that glorious ending that we would like to have? No. But do you know how they died? Singing hymns of praise. Do you get that picture? Why? Because they called on Elohim in this life. And sometimes Elohim has to say, I love you. I will not abandon you. Trust in me. And sometimes, as a spectacle to the universe, these martyrs took their stand for God. But their Elohim will come through because they'll spend eternity with Him. I do want to share a story of another man that I think it's a tremendous lesson for all of us, and that's the story of Manasseh. You know, when you think about the world, if somebody asks you, well, who's the world's wickest person that's ever been, who comes to your mind? Hitler? Pardon? Stalin. Most people don't think of that. Hitler killed 6 million, Stalin killed 20 million. Idi Amin? Well, let me tell you who ranks right up there, and that's one of God's chosen. He chose him to be king of Israel. He chose him to be one of the leaders of his people, and that's Manasseh. One of God's chosen kings over his children. They say that Manasseh was so wicked, killed so many people, that blood flowed in the streets. God's chosen. Long comes the Babylonians, and they capture Manasseh, and they take him back to the city of Babylon, and the Bible tells us in Chronicles that they put a hook through his nose, put chains on his hands, chains on his feet, and then they had a big parade for Manasseh. They took him and drug him through the streets of Babylon with people on both sides crying out, if this is the best God can do, ha, 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 and where is your God? How strong is that country of Israel? And here's their king with a hook through the nose, chains on his hands, chains on his feet. One of the world's worst murderers that's been on this earth. 
But he changed. He changed. Because God never gives up. And somewhere along the way, Manasseh came to his senses. Where have we heard that one before? That's right. He came to his senses. And he accepted God. Become a changed person. Now here's a point I want you to understand. He goes back to his kingdom. And what position do you think God puts him in? Does anybody know? Right back on the throne as king. Now sometimes that doesn't seem fair, does it? Because remember, it's your picture of God. To some, if you have that stern picture of God, he should have been out there as a street janitor cleaning up the streets that he had messed up with the lives of many people. We would say, that's fair. But let me tell you who Elohim is. He said, that's my son. That's the person I've created. I will sustain him and I've taken an oath. I will not forsake him. And when he came home, he put him right back where he belongs. It's a tremendous lesson for any church, any denomination. The sin that a person commits and the circumstances that he goes through is punishment enough, we can't think of enough punishment to heave upon him otherwise. Now when I get to heaven, one of the scenes I hope I get to see, in fact if I can find Isaiah first, I'm going to try to hang with Isaiah and be with him when he walks around that street up there And he runs in to guess who? Manasseh. Manasseh. Wow, isn't that going to be a meeting? For those that don't know, the last time they met, I think he was sawn in a log. Do you begin to see who God is? Do you begin to see how much He loves you? If you're in the Garden of Eden and you make a sin that's going to bring sin into the world, it's Elohim, it's Yahweh, it's Daddy, it's Jehovah Jireh, whatever name that He gives and whatever promise He makes, He's the one that takes them by the hand and leads them out. If you're the prodigal, He's waiting for you to come home. God loves you. I want to go to the New Testament. There's three stories that illustrate Elohim, the God that gives the power, who sustains you and will not leave you. And the first one I did this morning. Another picture of the good daddy had two sons, lost one and kept one, 50%. Not good enough for Elohim. He doesn't want 50%. He wants 100%. There's another story in Luke, the 15th chapter. A woman has 10 coins. And how many did she lose? One. Now let's see. She has 90% in hand. One lost, unless new math is different, she's only lost 10%. Was that good enough for her? No. Man, she went and found candles. She lit those candles. She put those candles all over that house. 
She got down on her knees and she looked behind every nook and cranny and on the floorboards behind the table. She searched all night till she found that one coin. And then she rejoiced. She was happy. Oh, and here it comes. What did she throw? A party. Didn't I tell you God likes parties? She threw a party. So 50%, God says, I can't take 50%. 10% loss, God says, I can't take 10%. And then the next story we have is a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. And how many did he lose? One. One. Now surely rationalization takes over here. I got 99 that are safe. I got one that was stupid, wouldn't listen to me, was always a frisky one. And he's lost. Surely my obligation is to the 99. Is that what he said? No. No. Everything was put on hold. And he went out and he searched and he looked and he found and he brought that one back. Do you know why that's important? Because 99 is fine. 99 is a good number unless the one is you. Then the whole world changes. The one is you. The whole world changes. God is not interested in being the shepherd of 99 out of 100. God is not taking an oath with the majority of the people. He's taking an oath with the only person that counts. And that's you. Please get that picture. Salvation is an individual thing. Thank God for our denomination. Thank God for our church here in Mount Pleasant. Thank God for the guidelines that we have. But salvation is an individual thing between you and God. And He shared with you in every way possible how much He loves and He cares and wants you. And so He comes to you today with the name of Elohim and says to each one of us, I've created you. I've sustained you. I take an oath. I make a promise. I will never, never abandon you. Well, what does that mean to you? Well, let me tell you what it means to me. It means no matter if I'm Adam and Eve, God will be there to take me by the hand and lead me out of the garden and put Himself there where I can come and worship Him. It means to me that no matter if I'm Noah and a flood's coming, He will give to me a means of escape. It means to me that if I'm Lot and I willfully choose to live in a city that's full of sin, He will send an angel to literally take me by the hand and drag me out. It means if I'm David, no matter how many sins that I commit and what I go through in my spiritual journey, 1 Kings 14.8, God will say of me as He did David, this is David who did everything right in my sight. What a tremendous scripture. It means to me that if I'm Samson and I get away from God, at the last when I call on Him, He will give me the power to bring the pillars down. It means if I'm Jonah and I want to run as far Far from God as I can, He will find me and make me a messenger. It means that if I'm a Gentile Samaritan woman 
and I come in the daytime because all my neighbors hate me and it's the only time I can get water that there will be a man at the well who will give me living water. It means to me that if I'm a eunuch and I'm traveling across a great desert that there will be a man named Philip that will show up and say, I notice you're reading a book. Do you understand what you're reading? It means to me that if I'm Martin Luther and I'm searching and I'm looking, that there will be a God who will send me to a text in Habakkuk that says, the just shall live by faith. It means that if I'm William Miller in 1844, a great disappointment that God will lead me in the channels that I need to be led. And it means to me that I am Ernie Pyle. And when my spiritual journey was on the low, there was my Elohim, there was my daddy, there was my Yahweh, there was my Jehovah Jireh saying, come home, my son. That's our Elohim. He will not abandon you. He wants you home. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If God had a billfold, your photo would be in it. He gives you a beautiful sunrise every morning. He gives you a beautiful sunset every evening. And every spring, He gives you beautiful flowers for you to enjoy. Every time you talk, He listens. God could live anywhere in the universe that He chose to live in. But He's chosen to live in your heart. Don't you get the picture? God is crazy about you. Dear Father, what a privilege it's been to be here in this nice church, this nice community. Today we presented four, we've, uh, yesterday and today we presented four pictures of you by the names you've chosen. Fathers, there's so many more. They're different facets, but they all lead to the one conclusion that is so important to you and hopefully is important to us. You want to be our God, you want us to be your people, and you simply want that relationship with you, that we get to know you more and more. And as the little girl said on the story of Enoch, every day God and Enoch went for a walk. They kept going further and further, so one day God said, Enoch, you're closer to my home than yours. Why don't you come home with me? Father, help us every day to get a clearer picture, a clearer understanding of your magnificent love. And may we all go home with you at the appropriate time. Thank you for your magnificent love. I want to thank you for what you've done in my life and also, Father, what you are doing in these folks' lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Appreciate it. It's our privilege to be here. May God bless all of you.